And we're going to read chapter 18 and the first few verses of chapter 19. Revelation chapter 18. We're following on from what Dan read in Revelation 17. After this, I saw another angel with great authority coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. He called out in a mighty voice, It has fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. She has become a home for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. The kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from her sensuality and excess. Then I heard another voice from heaven. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Pay her back the way she also paid and double it according to her works. In the cup in which she mixed, mix a double portion for her, as much as she glorified herself and indulged her sensual and excessive ways. Give her that much torment and grief. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen. I'm not a widow and I'll never see grief. For this reason, her plagues will come in just one day, death and grief and famine. She'll be burned up with fire because the Lord God who judges her is mighty. The kings of the earth who have committed sexual immorality and shared her sensual and excessive ways will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke from her burning. They'll stand far off in fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in a single hour your judgment has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, because no one buys their cargo any longer, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet, all kinds of fragrant wood products, objects of ivory, objects of expensive wood, brass, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, grain, cattle and sheep, horses, carriages, slaves, human lives. The fruit you craved has left you. All your splendid and glamorous things are gone. They will never find them again. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels and pearls, for in a single hour such fabulous wealth was destroyed. And every shipmaster, seafarer, the sailors and all who do business by sea stood far off as they watched the smoke from her burning and kept crying out, Who was like the great city? They threw dust on their heads and kept crying out, weeping and mourning. Woe, woe, the great city, where all those who have ships on the sea became rich from her wealth, for in a single hour she was destroyed. Rejoice over her heaven and you saints, apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced on her the judgment she passed on you. Then a mighty angel picked up a stone like a large millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, In this way, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down violently and never be found again. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No craftsman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. And the voice of a groom and bride will never be heard in you again. All this will happen because your merchants were the nobility of the earth because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. In her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all those slaughtered on the earth. After this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. A second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God 
who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. A voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all his servants and the ones who fear him, both small and great. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Have you ever met someone and been completely amazed or astonished? Uh, you, You might have been astonished because it was not what you expected. You might be astonished because you were overwhelmed or perhaps you were underwhelmed. You might have been astonished because that was not what you expected. Uh, I once met Kevin Rudd. Uh, I just finished a swim session in the gym in Parliament House. I was getting changed in the change rooms. A bloke plonked his gear down on the bench next to me in the change room. I looked to my right and said, G'day. He said, Hi. I held out my hand and said, I'm Bernard. Have a good workout. He said, I'm Kevin. Thanks. And that was it. When I look back on it, I was astonished. I had no knowledge of this bloke. I don't think he had any knowledge of me either, let's say. Uh, I did not know or grasp who he was or what he would become. And certainly as he stood there in his undies and singlet, he gave no overwhelming impression that he would be the Prime Minister of Australia. Looking back, I was amazed. And that can be the truth when we look at the world around us. Do we actually recognise the world for what it is? Do we recognise it for what it does? And do we understand what it will become? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that it is clear. Thank you that it exposes. I thank you that it reveals. Thank you that it is living and active. Father, help us to meet Babylon understand Babylon, and come out of Babylon. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Revelation is a clear word from God to his people so that they can be a faithful witness to the faithful witness who's Jesus. Uh, As John sits there on that rock called Patmos looking out over Rome as God's people receive this letter in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, they face a world that is completely opposed to God that demands what God deserves. And God speaks clearly, Jesus has already beaten sin, death and evil at the cross. Be a faithful witness. The book of Revelation is helpful because it gives us God perspective, a glimpse behind the curtain to see what is truly happening in the world. Uh, John sees what was, what is and what will be and he's reassured that the world is not out of control or in the control of anyone but God. God is on the throne and that slaughtered lamb has opened the scroll. Uh, We've just finished a section that looks at what will be four lots of seven. Therefore, looks at the same event in the same lots of cycles between Jesus' first coming and second coming. Layered on each other like overhead projector sheets, they paint a picture of God's plan to do what he promised, to wipe out our sin and to establish a new creation. To wipe out sin and to establish a new creation. And they culminated in the final just judgment of God as the seven bowls were poured out, focusing on what will happen on the last few moments. And at the height of that, Babylon the Great was remembered. Babylon the Great was remembered. And this section focuses in on Babylon. So we get a close-up of what happens when Babylon the Great is dealt with. Now, as we do this, just remember, as we said, week in, week out, this type of literature works in a special way, doesn't it? It's apocalyptic. It speaks with vivid pictures and images, colours and numbers about a a world that is really hard for us to grasp. But again, remember time and time again, those images are about qualities, not quantities. Qualities, not quantities. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Come, I'll show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute who is seated on many waters. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her and those who live on the earth became drunk 
on the wine of her sexual immorality. Then he carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness. Now point two on the outline, hey, John, come and look at the judgment. Now this is There are some confronting words here. The judgment of the notorious prostitute who sits on many waters. That, that imagery is in your face, isn't it? It picks up on a theme of adultery right across the Bible. God talks about rejection of him in terms of adultery, of being unfaithful, of not keeping your promises. And the imagery we meet here reminds us of the situation that Dan looked at back in Revelation 2 and 3. As God or Jesus spoke to his mob, and his mob were being seduced. His mob were tempted to have a bet both ways. His mob were under the pressure of fitting in. His mob had the allure of making it in the world. His mob were tempted to give good things, the devotion that God deserves. And this is immediately connected by this angel to political rulers. Did you notice that? Come and look at the notorious prostitute. And then the angel connects it to all of those human organizations that flourish in our world. John goes, this is what he sees. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels and pearls. She had a golden cup in her hand filled with everything detestable and with the impurities of a prostitution. On her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the detestable things of earth. Then I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. That's an understatement, isn't it? I was greatly astonished. There's stuff here that's subtle. There's stuff here that's not so subtle. But we're meant to pick up on the mimicry here. The woman here is a parody of the people of God. Remember, they were taken into the wilderness for safety. Where does he go to meet this woman? She's there in the desert and in the wilderness. The beast she rides on, well, we've met that beast before. That that beast mimics the power of God and his chosen king. I want to be God. And the woman's clothing, uh, that mimics the image of God we met in Revelation 4 and all the colours and the vibrancy and the jewels of God on his throne. And the woman, just like God on his throne, is holding something. A God held a scroll. What does this woman hold? What's a cup you don't want to drink out of? And the image is yet again confronting. She's got a name. Uh, It's a name that can only be revealed by God. That's why it's a mystery. God's got to rip the curtain back. It's a name that has a rich resonance right across the whole of the Bible. Have you ever noticed how much of Genesis is in Revelation? Her name is Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great. It's worth just pausing at that point to refresh our minds of what that means. We meet Babylon in Genesis 11. Humans have decided in Genesis 11 to build a city and a tower with its top in the sky. And to do that, they've got to stop moving. And they put down roots on a massive plain and they start making bricks and they start building. And their key motivation is clear Let's make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the earth. We remember this act of rebellion, don't we? Everyone knows about the Tower of Babel, but the building of the tower isn't sinful. (laughs) Building towers isn't a sin. Neither is making bricks. The sin is much deeper and has its tentacles everywhere. First, the humans decided they wouldn't obey God by moving out into all the world. God's told Adam and Eve to fill the earth and subdue it, and these humans go, no, not for us, God. We're going to settle down here. And second, they decide that they would take on God's role for themselves. God's given them a name, and they go, actually, we want that power for us. Rather than taking the name you've given us, God, we're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to take on your job, God. In fact, we can do your job better than you. 
And so God, in his wisdom, steps in and takes his microscope to look at this tremendous tower and then he judges them, exercising his true, right and unique authority. And so right throughout the Bible, Babylon is the name given to that, the concerted human endeavour to oppose God, the concerted human endeavour to oppose God and the right of God to judge it. And so when we meet Babylon the Great here, this woman who is parodying God's people, who is sitting on a beast that wants to be God, that's what's in our minds. She represents concerted human endeavour against God. And that lurks out there, doesn't it, in organisations and structures and powers, and it lurks in here. It lurks out there, but it lurks in here. And this woman, we are told, is not just about being famous and making your way in the world. Notice who she's partnered with. She's partnered with the devil to oppose God, to rebel against God, to replace God, to lash out against everything that belongs to God. And so God's mob get damaged. God's mob are oppressed, God's mob are seduced, God's mob are maimed and fed upon. And John is utterly astonished when he sees her. I I, I think John's astonished for a number of reasons. I I think he was expecting a moment of judgment. That's what the angel said he'd show John. And he said he sees this woman in all her fineness. I, I think he's astonished because it is so brazen, so brutal, so in your face. I think John's astonished because he starts to grasp who Babylon is, point three on the outline, and the angel then says, I'm going to explain this to you. Now, there are a lot of rabbit holes to go down here, aren't there? (laughs) There are a lot of mountains to climb and a lot of valleys to go into, a lot of water to swim in. But again, remember what I said at the start, these images are not about quantities, they're about qualities. And so as the angel explains what's going on here, there are echoes right through what we've already seen in Revelation. Verses 7 to 8 of chapter 17, the woman and the beast are inseparable. They're bound together. So wherever Babylon is, there is the parody of God. The beast looks and acts like the lamb but is destined for destruction. In in verse 8, the beast deceives the world. The whole world looks at this woman and goes, I want some of that. They look at everything that she offers on the back of this beast and they go, I want to be devoted to that. Everything she offers is good, but it's not God. In verse 9, she has power that is immense. They're the mountains and the kings. This woman has supreme power in this world. There is no rival to Babylon in this world. Uh, In verse 10, that power is connected with a cycle of earthly authorities that come and go and come and go and come and go. Governments, kings, rulers, institutions, authorities who all say we want what God deserves. In verses 13 and 14, that power has one aim. That power has one aim. These have one purpose. They give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will conquer them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Those with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Remember what we saw in those cycles of seven? God's people maimed and attacked, seduced and persecuted, brought in and compromised and killed, but the beast will be defeated because Jesus has already walked out of the tomb. Verse 15, the woman and the beast rule across every nation, tribe, language and tongue. It's not belonging to one skin colour or one language group or one geography. They've built an empire to mimic and parody God. Verse 16 to 18, they'll devour themselves. Look there in verse 16. The ten horns you see and the beast will hate the prostitute. They'll make her desolate, naked, devour her flesh, burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his plan by having one purpose and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Sin's never creative. 
Sin's always destructive, inherently and selfish. And so as we've seen time and time again, God says, remember the seals, remember the trumpets, remember the signs, remember the bowls. God says, if you want life that way, go and try it. And that's my judgment on you. And sin just cannibalizes itself and destroys itself, and that's the judgment of God. At this point, with all of that explained, John can now stand back and see what Babylon is. Babylon is any and every human endeavour that opposes God, that establishes itself against God. Babylon is any and every human endeavour and organisation that establishes itself against God. From people like Hitler and people like Pol Pot and people like Stalin and people like Domitian through to business enterprises that demand every moment of your time and every inch of your mind into pleasure and sport that will demand every part of your sinew or devotion down into every little corner of each and every human heart. Babylon is the expression of rebellion against God, the creation of every human enterprise that says, I'm God and God's not. And so as as John sits there on Patmos and looks out across the Mediterranean, what does he see? He sees Rome, doesn't he? Rome, which demands you bow down before Domitian, the emperor who is God. Rome that says, if you want to make a living, you must work with us. And we can see the same across every age. Any enterprise that seduces with power, economy, luxury, comfort, success, fame and name, any enterprise that demands what God deserves, that's where Babylon is. And Babylon falls, point four on the outline. Do you notice that when the destruction of Babylon is described, it's not described as a future? It's not even described as a present. It's already happened. It has fallen. Remember Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, she is conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the proclamation of God's people, the faithful witness. The parody of God is beaten by the blood of the Lamb. And God's mob proclaims that. Babylon is beaten, even as it thrashes around and seduces and still offers that cup, Babylon is beaten. And as as the world recognises the failure of Babylon, as it will on that last day finally and completely, what does the world do? Just look at chapter 18, verses 9 to 20. The, The kings of the earth, what do they do? Woe! Babylon is gone because our power was so intertwined with hers. What do the merchants of the earth do? Whoa! There goes our small business enterprise. There goes our investments. There goes our shares. There goes our stock exchange. There goes our trade in luxury items. There goes our trade in cattle. There goes our daily living. All built on the back of Babylon. And the traders, the seafarers, the shipmasters, they mourn too because their business trade enabled her seduction. The fall of Babylon enables John and God's mob to recognise and understand Babylon. Babylon is not just a political dictator. Babylon is not just a worldwide political organisation. Babylon is a lifestyle. Babylon is materialism. Babylon is comfort and success and opportunity and experience. All of those daily and constant things we meet as God's mob that want to turn good things into God things that blind us to what they truly are. And do you see what God says in 18.4-5 to to his people? Do you see what he says? Chapter 18, verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven. This is God's voice. Come out of her, my people, 
so that you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Very rare to get a command in Revelation. This is a command. Come out. Come out of Babylon. Did you hear that? God's more about to recognise Babylon, to understand Babylon, and to flee from Babylon. Babylon's rebellion is clear. It's piled up there before God. And God says to his mob, get out of there. And when you look back over Revelation, you can see that this is the substance behind the words of Jesus to his mob in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, remember Thyatira, who had tolerated sexual immorality and compromised with the culture around her? Do you remember Sardis, who had become apathetic and weak and insipid and compromised the practice of Jesus? Do you remember Laodicea, so lukewarm that she should be spat out because she'd compromised with the economy and the culture and the practice? And there, as God's mob settle and compromise and grow culturally obese and lazy, there's the blood of the saints. The blood of the saints, not by persecution, but by materialism. By the goodness of material comfort and cultural acceptability and economic opportunity and community acceptance and political relevance. The blood's not spilt by a knife, but by a dollar sign. Not bought by persecution, but bought by abundance. What does God say? Come out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon. And as God's people come out of Babylon, listen to what John hears. After this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality. He has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. Do you know, that's the first time hallelujah appears in the New Testament. And isn't it relevant? God has beaten Babylon. God is enough. The slaughtered lamb is sufficient and that is just and true and God's mob sing hallelujah for the first time in the whole New Testament. I was amazed that I got to meet Kevin Rudd. I I don't think he's ever started a talk about meeting Bernard Gabbard, let me tell you that. But let me tell you, I was more amazed as I worked through this passage and was led to meet Babylon, to recognise Babylon for what she truly was. I was really amazed this week as these passages pushed me to recognise who Babylon was, how she is so seductive, so alluring and so deceiving. And God helped John recognise Babylon and is doing the same for us. Babylon is everywhere and Babylon is in everything. She is not just political power, but she is economic seduction. She is material comfort. She is business success. She is community acceptance. She doesn't maim just through persecution but she maims through compromise and apathy and adjustment. Babylon is everywhere. Babylon is so active at turning good things into God things, taking the devotion God deserves and directing it to her. Babylon walks the whole world. Babylon's footsteps and fingerprints are in the corridors of power and the footpaths of our towns. Babylon resides in parliaments and in every human heart. She deceives and persuades and kills and seduces and she mimics God. Do we recognise Babylon? 
Do we recognize Babylon? To do it is as simple as listening to what God's word says. That's why that word mystery is so important. Do we know what God's word says? Do we recognize that to come out of Babylon is to step out of apathy and compromise as God's people and into astonishment at the sufficiency of God? Do we do that? And once we've recognized Babylon, do we remove ourselves from Babylon? Now, don't hear me wrongly. God is very clear that his people are to work. He made us to work. God is very clear that we need a roof over our heads and we have a responsibility to provide for our families. God is very clear that we are to live in our communities, that we must participate in the economy and business and sport of this town. But do we remove ourselves from Babylon? Do we proclaim and practice the sufficiency of Jesus? It might be as simple as thinking through our phrases. Is that really your forever house? Is today really another day in paradise? Are we really living our best life now? All of those phrases make a statement, don't they? Uh, It might be as deep as considering what we're preparing ourselves for. Uh, What are we preparing our families for? Are, Are we preparing our families Are we preparing ourselves for the return of Christ and the destruction of Babylon, our own death and mortality? Or are we preparing ourselves for Babylon by living in her seduction, by accepting that the good things she offers us are the God things? Such a removal might be as practical as to consider how our business, social, sporting, Political decisions reflect the one we're committed to and what that proclaims and practices. But please make no mistake, God's command is clear. Come out of Babylon. And do we rejoice over Babylon's fall? Do we give thanks to God that he has justly, rightly, completely dismantled and destroyed Babylon at the cross? that as Jesus walked out of the tomb, the sound wasn't the rock being rolled away, but the collapse of Babylon. Do we rejoice that such a moment reveals the complete sufficiency of Jesus and all that he provides? Or as Babylon falls, do we mourn the loss of a financial opportunity? an economic moment, a lifestyle choice, a reputation and a name that's been carefully constructed. Come out of Babylon. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Jesus really is sufficient. A slaughtered lamb has defeated Babylon. Father, that is remarkable. That is wonderful, that is just, that is gracious, that is good. Father, help us to follow this lamb out of Babylon into the sufficiency you provide for eternity. Father, as we do this, we pray that in this town, in our lives, in this country and in this world, we'll proclaim who is truly king and others will come to know his goodness. In his name we pray. Amen.